So should we get started? I think so. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Judy Shapiro, and I am the co-editor of um, the book that we're celebrating today, Our Extractive Age, Expressions of Violence and Resistance. And um, I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background on how this book came to be and why we're gathered here today to celebrate some of the chapters. So this book is um, the outcome of about a five year now grant from, I have to check this, the Norwegian Agency for International Cooperation and Quality Enhancement. That's kind of a mouthful. But um, the Norwegians um, wanted to promote exchange, intellectual and scholarly and student exchange between Norwegian institutions and American institutions. And um, we, together with the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, got a grant um, to do a whole bunch of things. And among the things that we got the grant to do are things that you've maybe heard of if you're a student, a current student, the famous pineapple practicum in Costa Rica came out of that grant and our semester exchange with the Norwegian University of Life Sciences comes out of that. Well, another big piece of it was what they called the research work package. And um, I was lucky to be assigned to spearhead that together with my counterpart at the University of Life Sciences, a guy named John Andrew McNeish, who although he's Norwegian is actually Scottish, but we'll leave that aside. And so the, this grant funded opportunities for scholars from both of our institutions to get together physically in the days before the pandemic. Um, a numerous of us went over to Norway also to get to know our counterparts there. And um, the idea was that through cross fertilization of scholarship, we would come up with something fresh. And what seemed to resonate with us most of all was a sense that violence around extractive industries, whether fossil fuels or timber or fisheries or minerals or precious metals has been ongoing since colonial times, of course, but it has intensified in the Anthropocene. And not only has it intensified, but it can be found in places you might not expect, like in construction of the built environment or even in geoengineering and the extraction of carbon from the atmosphere. So, we decided this was gonna be our common theme. And um, we invited anybody in both institutions who wanted to, to contribute a chapter. And um, we found a publisher um, and the publisher encouraged us to reach even beyond our two institutions. So later on in the process, we invited a few sort of superstars of the extractive um, extraction and violence discipline or area to contribute as well. So we have chapters by Michael Watts and we have chapters by Philippe Le Billon, um, but most of the chapters are by us um, and by our counterparts in Norway, as well as a whole pile of people from Finland um, who especially focus on extraction and violence. So, um, yeah, importantly for you who are listening, the grant allowed us to make this book what we call open access. So not all of you may know what that means, but it means is it's free. So don't listen if they're telling you to buy it for $60 because you can download it for free and you can download individual chapters for free. So today, um, what we're, yeah, what, I just want to say a little more on background. I remember as recently as maybe 15 years ago, we used to be able to enumerate on our fingers the names of the famous environmental activists who had been killed in the line of duty. People like Nigeria's Ken Sarawiwa or Brazil's Chico Mendes, also Sister Dorothea Stang was also killed in Brazil. 
Now, as I think Garrett is gonna tell us in her presentation, the numbers are off the charts. This fusion of human rights abuse and environmental protection as people in the front lines of trying to save their homelands from global corporate interests is just off the charts. So this is a really important change. And also as globalization has speeded up these processes of extraction and global capitalism is looking everywhere for new resources as the, the earth's resources are depleted and new markets, you know, uh, so it's this kind of a logic of capitalism that has gotten to be um, very intense. So that's our contribution, I think here. So let me give you an overview of what we're gonna do. So Paul Wapner is also a contributor of this volume, our professor Paul Wapner, um, but he's teaching right now. So um, Christiana is going to show us to begin a four minute video of Paul talking about his chapter, which comes from the theoretical section. And then we'll move in the same order that it goes through the book. So Garrett will talk about um, the Escazú Agreement and the intensification of violence around um, land defenders. Vicky will talk about violence in, the, in construction and the built environment. Then Simon, who has a chapter in unconventional modes of extractivism, will talk about geoengineering and the extraction of carbon. And then if it looks like the time is going along well, we'll show you another four minute video, which was my chapter written together with my Chinese colleague about extraction on the Belton Road. And then we'll kind of talk to each other for a little bit, and then we'll open it up with the aim of ending promptly by 2.15 at the, at the latest. So, um, Christiana, can we watch Paul for four minutes? Hi, my name is Paul Wapner, and I teach global environmental politics at American University. My chapter is called Thresholds of Injustice, Challenging the Politics of Environmental Postponement. Now that's a convoluted title, so let me just kind of lay out what the argument is. So this book is about hyper-extractivism, and what I, my contribution is to suggest that hyper-extractivism is not something simply that the environmental movement responds to, but is partly responsible for. So what that means is that um, in the chapter, I talk about the emergence of the modern environmental movement in the 1960s and the 1970s. And what I do is explain that the narrative that the movement used at that time period was a globalist one focused on global thresholds. So books like This Endangered Planet or The Limits to Growth and so forth, The Population Bomb, these, these efforts and the movements that were accompanying them were pointing out that we ha only have one planet and given population growth and technology and consumption and affluence that we are pushing up against those thresholds. The, um, and there's lots of insight there. But the problem with that narrative is that when we think about global thresholds as the measure of environmental harm, it takes a lot to get there. And so much environmental danger, harm, violence, and so forth takes place below that kind of threshold and that gets lost. And this allows and it generates what I call in the paper, a politics of postponement, because it means that governments and societies can keep deferring significant environmental protection efforts because what they're seeing doesn't raise to that level of conscious awareness because it doesn't cross these global thresholds. Also, it does this narrative, it lumps us all together and says we're on one planet and we just have to watch before we crumble or cripple the organic infrastructure of the planet itself. But we know that so many people are suffering and are on the frontiers of environmental degradation without 
those forces rising to that globalist level. For example, today, we know that we cannot let the temperature of the planet, the average temperature, go to over 1.5 or at most 2 degrees Celsius. But what does 1.5 or 2 degrees mean for victims of Katrina or those living on the front lines who have had their lives destroyed short of this global threshold? So what this article, what my chapter talks about is, it suggests that there's almost what's often called epistemic injustice going on by this globalist narrative. And it's a call for coming back to look at resistance to community level, neighborhoods, peoples who are facing severe um, suffering and violence and recognize that that is the heart of environmental degradation. And that should be the focus of the environmental movement's attention. So uh, I'm thrilled to be part of this effort, and I'm honored to be part of this book launch. And um, yeah, these are tough things, but um, I appreciate the time to share these thoughts. Great. Um... So we'll move directly now to Garrett. Great, thank you. Um, thanks, Judy, for organizing this. Um, and thanks to all the participants. Um, I see your names and recognize some, so I'm excited to keep developing this conversation. So my particular um, chapter was about the Regional Agreement on Access to Information, Public Participation and Justice in Environmental Matters in Latin America and the Caribbean, a very long, um, and bureaucratic sounding document that is nevertheless exceedingly important in this issue of violence in our hyper extractive age. The shorthand is the Escasu Agreement based out of Escasu, Costa Rica, where it was um, first formulated. And it um, just went into force this year in April of 2021, um, actually April 2020, but then it's kind of carried over. It's still though only been signed by 24 countries. It's within Latin America and it is ratified by 12 at this point. But the purpose of it is to protect land defenders and human rights and agrarian land-based life defenders, water defenders from criminalization and from violence, state-sanctioned violence. So the chapter itself um, that I worked on for this, for this um, book um, is thinking about the criminalization of agrarian justice and land defense movements and following the lead of the grassroots groups, groups themselves, La Via Campesina and all the other transnational networks of agrarian justice organizations and frontline groups. There was an urgency, there's been an urgency to not just call out the violence and the murdering of land defenders, but call out the criminalization. And so this is a nuance point that is worth unpacking. And so what the actual groups on the ground and thus the journalists covering um, are saying is that the violence is happening, not just on the physical level, but on the legal terrain. And it's a very important move that has long roots in colonialism um, and the racialized policing of coloniality, but it is important to understand in terms of organizing and countering. So um, the article itself starts off with looking at Berta Caceres and all of these other land defenders, as Judy began, um, who are, have long traditions in defending many of them indigenous or Afro descendant and are facing racism as well as classism and sexism, as well as the broader kind of apparatus of state and business collusion and the kind of beast of, of violence that, that is accompanying and works with hyper extraction. Um, and so the nuance though, is thinking about how criminalization works and how it's actually a, um, a stopgap measure that's actually in response to the legal organizing and the policy and the political organizing that the frontline grassroots groups themselves are doing and winning. So as grassroots groups are organizing to change laws, to call out um, hyper extraction and the violence of the polluters and the violence of, of um, the, the security forces that are working right next to the dam or right next to the logging to violently kill um, and torture and terrify all of the land defenders of the area. Um, there needs to be thought through how actually the criminalization process is a way for the state to um, hide the violence. So criminalization, the kind of clarifying power of this is that it helps show how there's a racialized policing 
and that violence has been ubiquitous within the political economies of colonialism and now with agro-industrialization and ongoing coloniality. So criminalization works to legitimize the violence as well as to tuck it away as a legal issue to be resolved between the beneficent state allegedly and the individualized criminal. So it individualizes the land defenders and undermines the kind of broader network of organizing that they've been building. Um, I also talk about how it's important to call, talk, talk about the agrarian context. Oftentimes these, you know, global witness just put out another report two days ago that in fact there's called last line of defense. I would drop it in the chat box, but I don't see a chat box, um, but do check it out. It's the global witness and 227 land defenders were murdered in 2020. So even more than the year before. So these numbers are increasing and the broader context is oftentimes lumber and, and timber and coal and fossil fuels, but largely it's agro industry is the kind of the, the, the perpetrator or the culprit of these violences and criminalizations. Um, so calling it agrarian is important to push back against um, just thinking about this as a human rights issue and as an environmental defense. A lot of the land defenders have deep roots in agrarian ways of life and in land-based life and in the reality that the earth is nourishing their communities. And if the water gets poisoned, that's curtailing the very fabric and the conditions of life and health for their communities. So trying to understand the violence against land defenders is an agrarian and an agricultural issue as well as um, broader uh, racialized policing and a criminalization. So the Eskasu agreement is really an extraordinary agreement and is really kind of a political reclaiming on the part of the indigenous groups and the African descendant groups and the pe peasant campesino groups, the legal terrain. So the criminalization is an attempt by the state and the industry collusion to push the legal terrain um, to, to have it hide the violence. And then all of these groups are organizing to reclaim the legal and the policy terrain through such instances as the Escasu Agreement. Um, there's so much more to say. I think I'm out of time, but I, I, um, I'll, I, Judy, tell me, I'll, maybe right. I'll stop now and then we can no, braid all of our thoughts in. You're okay, you're okay, you're okay. Okay. Talk some um, more. <laughs> okay. Um, so the other um, dimension of this that I think is important is the long durée of colonialism and how criminalization has been used historically um, as, as an arm of colonialism and as land theft um, and as, as territorial capture. And so the, the movements themselves are looking at the current wave of criminalization as not a new tactic, but as an age old tried and tested tactic. And so even the kind of cultural memory of fighting back against criminalization as an individualizing force um, and as a decontextualizing force and as a force of hiding and legitimizing violence there's long histories of fighting against police states and their collusion with industry within the colonial context, now within the post-colonial, neo-colonial, uh, neoliberal or hyper-extractive context. So the kind of cultural memory of resistance is being tapped into and also circulated. So you have organizations deep in Central America, obviously Honduras and Nicaragua, um, Colombia is really a site of, actually that's the most environmental defenders who were killed in 2020, according to the Global Witness Report is in Colombia, um, the Philippines, Congo, so really all over the world, organizations are grassroots, like really low resource on the front line, have the boot at their neck or organizing across language barriers, um, across continents and kind of thinking through the political responses to the violence and to the criminalization from a transnational organizing perspective. Um, and so the Escasu Agreement, even though it's a very official formal treaty, I encourage everyone to look it up. There's not much written about it. It's strangely off the radar in scholarship. Um, when I was trying to research for this chapter, I actually couldn't find much written about it, even though it's actually really quite historic and pivotal. And in kind of broader mainstream culture, it's not really talked about when in fact it sets such an incredible legal precedent, but it is the result of organizing. I had the opportunity to interview the Costa Rican M M team at the embassy in DC, who was part of the multi-year facilitation and negotiation of this agreement. And it, it emerges from movements who then you know, had people come in and sit at the table and negotiate and work with national level governments and you know, kind of get this on the, on the docket you know, at the UN level. So it has made its way to a formal agreement, but in fact, it emerges from really transnational and frontline organizing who are particularly all of these people very interested in reclaiming the legal terrain and the policy terrain to defend themselves from criminalization and to defend their land and water um, from the ravages of extraction. Okay. Thank you, Garrett. Um, yeah, obviously a very important chapter, a very exciting chapter. So um, everybody download that chapter and um, we'll move on now to Vicki. Thanks, Judy, and thanks, Garrett. Garrett, it's so humbling to go after the tale of 
you know, oh my heavens, Vicky, I have so much respect for you and your work. It's, it's just, it's amazing. Um, so I, I am a, an architect. Um, so that makes me a practitioner of um, the stuff I'm going to talk about and rail against, basically. I don't know whether my chapter is partly an expiation of guilt um, or <laughs> actually an explanation uh, to the kind of non-design world of, of these hidden effects of extractivism. So my, the name of my chapter, the title of my chapter is Extraction in the Global Built Environment. Uh, violence and other social consequences of construction. And the purpose of it is really to just bring a broader awareness of the uh, concept of extractive violence uh, that our built environment embodies. Um, and I say this as one like probably many of you who is quite seduced. Uh, and of course I'm an architect, so I attempt to seduce people also in this way by the products of design and the built environment. Um, and so, you, you know, this question of, you know, we have green development, we have green buildings, but in fact, the paradox, and, you know, you don't have to seek too far to understand this is true, the paradox of, of building and green building is that it, it, it causes extraction in all sorts of ways. So um, there's not only the extraction of raw materials, which of course I get to talk about in, in um, glorious detail, um, but there's also the extraction of construction labor increasingly uh, around the world um, um, and the, the extraction of communities that get displaced by development. Um, but more than any of this, um, the, this is all being driven as a dynamic by real estate investment. And um, something that I call delirium, it's really this delirious quest for city status, global city status for the biggest, the best, the most developed, and indeed the most green and sustainable. Um, so um, I begin my chapter by really looking with uh, at an image, uh, it's not a literal image in the chapter, but it's a verbal image of, of Singapore's Changi Airport, the rain vortex waterfall, which is again, to, to speak of a seductive built environment image, that is it. And one that was much celebrated in all sorts of green, construction and design circles as being biophilic, um, healing and restorative. Um, but in, in fact, it doesn't take, uh, you don't have to go far to realize that it, it, the way that construction is done, certainly in um, uh, that part of um, Southeast Asia and um, in the Near East uh, is through sort of indentured servitude of uh, laborers but also built on literal sand extraction from Southeast Asia uh, countries. The idea that this is an image building exercise for Singapore um, built on this extraction. Um, the idea that global investors really seek investment opportunities um, from around the world um, in various hyper-built structures um, it could be that they are expressions, for example, as they might be in the Emirates of places to put your fossil fuel extraction wealth uh, to grow um, for the uh, profit of the investors. Um, or in the, you know, the case of, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, as I point out in the chapter, you know, these are everywhere, even in Washington, D.C., where I'm sitting now, um, not far away. Uh, the government of Qatar has invested in city center DC, which has become a place for um, high priced politicians and uh, consultants to live as well as uh, the most luxury shopping center uh, here. Um, I get to talk in this chapter about all sorts of uh, unseen invisible consequences, um, not only sand mining, which goes on a great ecological cost throughout, uh, you know, countries, um, some of which have begun to refuse 
people that sand mine, uh, Vietnam, for example, um, but uh, also just the production of the most ubiquitous construction material in the world, which is concrete, that is made of various components that are extracted from distances and whose effects, ex extractive effects are, are largely unseen. And we have this fueling our you know, current frenzied um, craze of construction. Interestingly, not only paused by COVID, I would say returning uh, in force. And then uh, again, this idea of uh, tracking construction labor, what it means to have people that are labor forces that extract themselves voluntarily from their communities to go build other buildings in other parts of the world, um, how extraction and displacement and the whole idea of modernity itself really leads to uh, displacement of communities. Certainly, um, you know, mentioning and, and focusing briefly on uh, the fact that this is established practice in urban redevelopment um, to use modernity and modernization and now resilience planning as a way to displace communities perhaps of you know, marginalized communities or communities of color. Um, all this is, is basically leading to and looking at these forms of extractivism in the built environment is to really a, a plea for architects and all of us to really think of buildings as they should initially be thought of, which is as webs of socio-ecological relationships first and their impact there, rather than just things, material things, that they are that, and importantly that, and aesthetically that, certainly. Um, but to begin for the rest of us to ask questions uh, before we basically start to build, um, you know, questions that folks are beginning to ask in a more widespread way about who's going to use this? Why is this constructed object being built? Whom does it privilege? Um, how will it exacerbate uh, conflict in its location? Uh, how will it alter a regional ecology? Um, who's the investor? Uh, looking at, a, at, a, at a, a longer time horizon than normal, stretching into the past to look at maybe the origin story of a place, a people, of where you intend to build, but then also looking very far into the future as far as you can to think about or to kind of bird dog or point to particular impacts socially, ecologically. Um, we certainly have small ways to do this now. Usually the, this kind of looking at potential impacts is done by experts. I argue that it, it should be done, um, in fact, by the not a hired third party expert, by the team of people that propose to develop, that then present the scenarios uh, in an accountable way to the communities in which this development will take place. So there, you know, the chapter ends with many specific recommendations um, for what could be or maybe should be done. Um, and this is my, you know, vision for the future that, in fact, you know, there, there is a socio-spatial assessment of a neighborhood, of regional conditions of demographics, of needs, that there's transparent reporting of who's investing in this amount of capital investment, you know, why it's taking place. Uh, certainly a life cycle accounting of material resources that has been broached by the green building world, the idea of LCA or life cycle assessment, basically embody carbon at the moment, but widening that to a life cycle assessment uh, that is really almost um, anthropological in its um, if, um, implications. Um, then certainly one thing I'd love to see is that every such project has a plan for its adaptive reuse. What is the, if you're looking at the end of life of the built environment, instead of thinking as we do, 
now, it's outlived its purpose, um, will tear it down. Uh, can you evolve an adaptive reuse plan? Um, the idea again of keeping better track of the constructors themselves, of labor practices, um, involving citizens in a way that it doesn't just um, have them down on the ladder of citizen participation where they're just you know, giving assent, but actually maybe compensating citizens uh, in, in a sort of jury duty way for sitting in service on the review of such projects. And then maybe um, establishing some public escrow funds to be able to document these effects over time. Um, that's my wish <laughs> expressed in this chapter, but um, I had very interesting time writing it. Thank you so much, Judy, for leading us into this world. Really appreciate it. And I will say that some of the other contributors who work on resources and extraction were very, very excited to have the voice of an architect contribute to this conversation. Very, very fresh for them. So thank you, Vicki. And um, for something even more fresh, <laughs> let's talk about geoengineering and extraction. Over to Simon. I don't know how fresh it is, Judy, but I appreciate the introduction. Hey, it's nice to be with you all. My name is Simon Nicholson. Uh, as along with everybody else you've heard from today, I'm a member of the Global Environmental Politics faculty in the School of International Service at American University. Um, I'm actually on leave this semester, but we'll be back on campus in the spring. Looking forward to interacting uh, with those of you who are attached to the American University community um, come, come the new year. Now, my chapter for this book builds on work that I do on the intersection between emerging technologies and environmental well-being. And in particular, for this chapter, I was interested in looking at what's called carbon removal. Um, carbon removal is the idea that some amount of carbon dioxide might be removed from the atmosphere and put into productive use or long-term storage as part of responding to climate change. Um, one way to think about carbon removal then is as a type of de-extraction. It's, um, it's trying to undo the harms associated with prior extractive industries. So in this case, the idea is use carbon removal, this idea of sucking carbon dioxide down out of the atmosphere as a way to fix some of the climate harms associated with the extraction of fossil fuels um, or the cutting down of forests and the plowing of, of land for farming. Um, now, of course, it's more complicated than that. So what I do in the chapter is that I use the notion of extraction um, and questions about extractivism as a kind of a conceptual leaping off point to look at carbon removal and the role that it's starting to play in international climate politics. Uh, in fleshing out that conceptual piece, right? So, so for me, in thinking about extraction, extraction is kind of a neutral term. Um, extraction is something that every living creature on the planet does just, in, just as a matter of being alive, right? So if the tree as it grows is extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and nutrients from the soil uh, and turning those things into food that are then available to other species, potentially, right? And also putting out oxygen into the atmosphere, which is available for extraction by other species, right? Um, extraction is just like the way things work in biological terms. Uh, but extractivism is different. Extractivism is a logic. Extractivism is a particular human way of interacting with the world around us uh, through a set of processes, through a set of kind of governing ideas that lead to pretty perverse, actually, environmental outcomes, right? So all of us who study global environmental politics are studying in some ways um, the fruits of an extractivist understanding as it's present in the way human beings interact with one another and interact with the environment around us. Um, so that, that may seem a little um, kind of soapboxy, but the, the punchline when it comes to carbon removal is this. Um, carbon removal is needed now as a part of climate response, because as you heard from Professor Wapner in the presentation that, that we saw from his video, um, we're, we're bumping up against temperature thresholds globally, um, which are really problematic. Carbon removal is going to be a necessary part of climate response moving forward. But if carbon removal is undertaken according to an extractivist logic, then we get into trouble. We end up collectively doing the same sorts of things again under a different guise that got us into the climate mess in the first place. So carbon removal good, 
carbon removal, according to an extractivist logic, potentially really problematic. Uh, what I do in the rest of the chapter is then kind of flesh out um, two ways in which carbon removal is being captured in some basic ways by an extractivist understanding. Um, and I'll just cover these very briefly and then turn back to Judy. Um, the first way is through the computer models by which scientists and policymakers look to understand potential climate change futures. And the second way is through policy instruments and through carbon removal projects themselves uh, and, and the sorts of actors and influences and money and so forth that are coming to bear on carbon removal as a set of practices in the world. Um, so again, just very quickly on those two points. So first of all, carbon removal is only being talked about as part of climate response because the big climate models that policymakers and scientists use to try and understand climate futures um, seem to be telling us that it's hard to avoid large-scale climate change without now the use of carbon removal approaches. Um, the main tools that are used, the main kind of computer models that are used are a set of tools called integrated assessment models, IAMs. And what I do in the chapter is I, I look at how integrated assessment models um, allow for certain understandings of the future, but they foreclose other understandings of the future. Right, so the integrated assessment models, um, they tell us certain really important things about the way economies interact with the environment, but they do so according to a very strict set of scenarios, um, which are good for the teams that run IAMs, but aren't necessarily useful um, fully for social consideration of something as complicated as carbon removal. Um, I, won't, I won't get into any more detail than that, um, except to say that what I do in the chapter is I argue for a particular use of integrated assessment models when it comes to carbon removal, and also for the use of other ways of looking into the future to understand um, what the climate changed world is going to look like. Um, and then secondly, when it comes to carbon removal practices in the world, there are lots of different potential ways to draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, from planting trees, um, managing forests, managing um, soils through farming and other practices, um, all the way through to machines called direct air capture facilities um, that act like artificial trees to draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, turn it into a liquid, and enable the pumping of that liquid back into the places from which oil and gas was originally extracted. Right? Um, all of these different potential practices or tools, from tree planting all the way through to direct air capture, may have a role to play moving forward. Um, but there are lots of different potential ways to do each of those things. Um, if the world tries to do a whole bunch of tree planting um, and use that as a way to respond to climate change, that could be a travesty um, for the way uh, individual peoples and groups of peoples interact with lands in various places. Um, and we're already seeing the dangers with large companies um, claiming what are called carbon offsets through tree planting um, as a way to respond to the climate ills that are caused by the corporation's activities. Um, much more to say there, but, but that's, that's all I'll say for now. Um, when it comes to something like direct air capture, again, direct air capture could be one way um, for certain segments of the economy um, to clean up a mess um, in a way that buys time for other forms of climate response to take hold, um, or as a way to, to deal with what are called hard to abate sectors in climate terms, place uh, part, parts of the economy that may need fossil fuels for some time into the future. Uh, but the way carbon uh, direct air capture is developing at the moment, there's, there's a lot of talk of enhanced oil recovery, it's called, taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and using it to uh, pump more oil out of abandoned oil wells, um, which is allowing fossil fuel companies to write some of the rules around how direct air capture is starting to develop. Um, that may be like a dance with the devil that's necessary in long-term climate policy terms, or it could just be are buying into the same extractivist relationships that got us into this mess in the first place. I don't have good answers to how to sort through all of that. Um, we need attention to the fact that as carbon removal starts to develop, these sorts of relationships are going to be um, more and more to the fore and need to be critically interrogated. So again, just, just to get to the punchline, carbon removal is going to be necessary. Carbon removal, according to an extractivist logic, is itself a form of violence on the planet. Um, and uh, you know, again, I'll just join my colleagues in thanking Judy, um, our colleagues in, in Norway and Finland and elsewhere who contributed to this volume. 
Um, as you can see, it's a sprawling book with lots of people writing about lots of different kinds of things um, using this idea of extractivism or extraction as a, as a jumping off point. And uh, Judy, thanks for leading us. Yeah, so I hope you can see from Simon's presentation how valuable these concepts are because they reframe the way we approach some problems. So actually Simon laid this out for us really well, but he didn't lay out a third thing. So let me just take one second. So we have extraction, which is a neutral description. We have extractivism, which is a logical mindset. And then we have extra activism with a capital A in the middle there, which has to do with the resistance to this kind of extraction. And so those three concepts thread their way throughout our whole book. All right, everybody, if this isn't too much for you, I'd like to add one more chapter. Um, it's the chapter that I contributed together with a co-author. So we also have a four minute video about China on the Belt and Road. So Christiana, can you? Hi, I'm Judy Shapiro. I teach at American University in Washington, DC. Hi, I am Yifei Li. I teach environmental studies at New York University, Shanghai. And Yifei and I have been working together on China's environmental authoritarianism. And so it was a great opportunity to contribute a chapter to this book. Um, our feeling is that China's rise has had enormous impact on the planet and we wanted to explore not only the conventional, if you will, extraction of resources like grain and fossil fuels and minerals, but some unconventional um, extractions of resources. So we, um, the title of our chapter is Rethinking Extractivism on China's Belt and Road, Food, Tourism and Talent. Um, one of the things um, that seems very important about the Belt and Road Initiative is its environmental track record. Um, we hear a lot of people looking at issues such as the loss of biodiversity, coal-fired power plants, and the increased carbon emissions associated with that. And those are absolutely important. But at the same time, those aren't the only important issues to consider when it comes to the environmental implications of the Belt and Road, which is why in this book, we decided to pivot to some of those other areas uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative that hasn't been um, discussed, that hasn't been analyzed by the academic community and the policy circles at large. We looked at three specific cases in the Belt and Road they are the Dairy Belt and Road Initiative, um, the educational aspect of the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as tourism under the Belt and Road um, rubric. We look at, for example, under the Dairy Belt and Road, even though many of the developments between China and New Zealand, Australia, the Netherlands, or even Germany, are framed as private corporations going outside China, to explore business opportunities. But one of the things we have to recognize is that these Chinese dairy conglomerates are owned by the Chinese state by a very large contingent. Um, we're looking at, for example, the Chinese dairy conglomerate by the name of Meng Yeo, which is 35% owned directly by the Chinese state. And these developments whenever they go out they would say well the belt and road aspires to build what they call a shared uh, global community of shared human future and in the case of the dairy belt and road they say that they aspire to to build a global community of shared dairy future so we're seeing a lot of these close alignments between chinese private businesses and the state the same goes for tourism when it comes to developing tourism in Central Asia, a lot of these projects are utilizing Chinese state investments, Chinese technologies to appeal to Chinese tourists, making these recipient countries in Central Asia more dependent economically on uh, Chinese tourists and the revenue that, that is generated from that tourism. And the same goes for educational Belt and Road initiatives, where we see the export of not only Chinese ideas and philosophies, 
the Chinese technologies and technical specifications and tools. All of that contributes not only to the worsening of the ecological condition, but also giving China unprecedented geopolitical leverage over its Belt and Road partners around the world. Now, in some, we can say that this form of extraction is extraction of control of supply chains. It's extraction of culture and sort of erasing of local culture and imposition of Chinese culture. And finally, it's ex actually extraction of human resources. Okay, so um, I'd like now to open it up to the panelists to see if you have reflections having heard more of the other chapters or just anything you wanted to add that you didn't get to add in your regular time. And then we'll open it up to um, the participants. Garrett? Um, well, I was just going to say, thinking about Vicky and did her comments, thinking through like a citizens panel or a way for there to be more integrative, you know, public governance, you know, from 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 people who are impacted or or the, the stakeholders rather than just a um, top down imposition with greenwashing. And obviously, Simon, your work is thinking through. The, geo, the geopolitics of geoengineering, which are so top down and are so macro um, and, and so, you know, frankly, capital driven, even though there's a governance, a strong governance framework, but it just seems like almost improbable to think of a way where there would be really grassroots input, authentic input into some of these massive decisions. Um, and one of the other chapters in the book um, is thinking through prior informed consent and how that is oftentimes a sham, and obviously people know this, and actually a way for further extraction to happen under the alleged box checking. So, and I feel like in the, my, my work that the human rights defenders, so many of them are um, outright murders that are not even um, brought to justice at all. So the very few that get any kind of leverage in a legal sphere of having, you know, um, of having the perpetrators of the violence be be held held to account. So I, it, it seems daunting, to think through what authentic, you know, frontline community engagement and decision making and and input would look like in these macro, you know, um, projects from China on through Latin America on through you know, African context. So, and yet the sheer scale of the people involved and hurt by many of these extractions so vastly outweighs the few people who allegedly win or profit that on, on scale or numbers alone, ultimately it's gonna reach some tipping point where there's gonna to have to be some kind of mass mobilization to think through a structural transformation. But I don't know, I'd love to kind of think through with the audience in particular on, after they read the book or extra of the book, if reading it felt like even more daunting to see some of these examples, or if people were actually thinking about there being some tipping point where there was so much grassroots engagement and involvement in trying to work in these policy and legal spheres to make impact. Vicky, I'm I'm a quick on that, Judy. Um, no, I was going to call on Vicky and Simon. Go, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I mean, one, one, one thing it might be worth saying, Garrett, um, is that there seems, to, I, I focus mainly on the US context, right? And so, yes, climate politics has these global aspects to it, and something like carbon removal is being considered globally. Uh, but the way that something that has these global aspects finds its way into the world is through, in the United States context, federal policy and local projects. Right, and one, one of the things that we're really seeing in the US environmental sphere, um, and, and I wonder if this comports with the way you see it, is that there's a real pushback against the technocratic understanding of environmental action. This idea that new technologies um, or particular single shot policies handed down by bureaucrats are going to be the way that you know, we collectively fix the environmental situation we find ourselves in. And instead with um, the environmental justice conversation as it's developed in the US context in particular, there's just this growing and really deep understanding um, that dealing with the environmental situation means um, dealing with a whole bunch of social ills, means 
making sure that those who are most impacted by environmental problems um, are most present in the decisions taken about how to respond to them, right? Um, and at least in this moment, from the Biden administration on down, there's a, there's a slow embrace of, of at least rhetoric around that understanding of, of the way environmental action needs to move. Um, and so when it comes to something like carbon removal, I think you're right. It, it's got this, these kind of big global aspects because it's captured in abstract computer models, big intergovernmental panel on climate change reports. Um, it finds its way into the nationally determined contributions that countries take um, into the, the uh, conversations at Glasgow under the Paris Agreement that we'll see later this year. But actual carbon removal is local projects, right? And those local projects are sites for local contestation or for local engagement. Um, and federal policy is attentive to that, at least under this current administration. So, so I don't know that it's as dark necessarily as your comment suggested. Um, but I think, I think the opportunities are actually pretty, um, pretty grand right now um, for thinking about new forms of community-based engagement around something even as abstract as carbon removal. Mm -hmm. Now, if I could add, um, um, one of the challenges is the multi-scalar aspect of um, extraction. And uh, the very last chapter in our book by Michael Watts is kind of a tour de force um, in that he talks a lot about the hidden quality of many of these forces that are operating at the local level. Particularly, he does a brilliant job of unpacking the capital flows and um, sort of hidden investments. So I think one of the contributions of the volume is actually bringing together a political ecologist sort of focus on the extremely local together with a political economy sort of focus on trade and the environment and then bringing in, you know, just unusual ways of thinking about these issues. Vicky, did you want to anything? I, what I want to do is um, invite the audience. We already have a question from Suzanne White, which I want to, um, Susan White, um, which I actually plays it. I think I'm the person to answer it. I don't know if everybody in the audience can see the questions or not, but she wants to know, um, can any of you talk about the push to extract more critical minerals in the US and abroad and any concerns about this mining process? But this actually, as a China person, I think she means the rare earths. And if you do China, you can't escape the conversation about rare earths. So here we are. So China, as you know, um, probably has had a near monopoly on rare earths, which are actually not rare at all, but they're just hard to um, extract. <laughs> um, and um, China has used their monopoly or near monopoly of rare earths as a geopolitical playing card to put enormous pressure on countries like Japan and by implied threat, the US, if they, if they stop exporting rare earths to Japan, it could collapse Japan's economy. And so rare earths are used on everything from solar panels to uh, weapons to um, electronic components and so on and so forth. Um, the other thing to know about the, the mining of rare earths, which is what Susan is asking about, is that the mining process itself, like mining so many minerals, tends to be very polluting and toxic for the, the miners themselves. So yeah, we certainly have lots of concerns about this. And in reaction to China's monopoly, the US has started to try to restart some of these mines because they don't, we don't wanna be as dependent on China as we are. And so, you know, I, sure, yeah, it's concerning, full stop, yeah. Um, but it's also really important, I think the message there is that a lot of these so-called green technologies have their hidden side. And so, um, you know, a battery factory, right? You must say, oh, battery, good. But it's not so good for the people who are making the battery. And so we always have to think about who wins and who loses. And even when we're feeling very virtuous about using green technologies, it may not be so green for the people who've created those um, objects. Are there other questions or does Vicky want to answer any, ask it? Um, and, oh yeah, here's another question. Hi, I have a question for Garrett related to the Eskazoo Agreement. Um, considering the fact that many resource 
rich territories in the LAC are managed and owned by indigenous people and Afro-descendant communities, do we think academia is paying sufficient attention to the way in which both state and non-state actors benefit from violating the collective land rights of these communities? Okay, I guess the answer great is question. probably no. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I didn't get the name of the student, I just have MM, but MM, this is a great question. Um, I, I would say that cer certainly not. And I feel like unfortunately the international studies framework oftentimes um, centers the nation state as the kind of dominant scale of reference um, in part. And even if people focusing on kind of liberal institutionalism or the United Nations or, you know, kind of broader treaty and multilateral um, forums, we get stuck at the nation state as the dominant scale of reference and think about China does this, India responds by this, Brazil responds by this. And so there's just an epistemic erasure, as well as a political erasure, as well as an undermining and entrenching of an erasure of the plurinationality of all of these countries. And in particular, um, Brazil and um, Colombia and many of these places that the, the territories that are most sought after, that have the most ecological value, the most value from a climate resilience perspective, the most value from a critical minerals or a fossil fuel pr perspective, from an agroecological perspective, the like really important waterways and, and fertile lands are the most targeted by extraction um, by state actors, non-state actors, industry actors. Um, and so continuing to just put that into the umbrella of this is Colombia, as opposed to the Afro descendant territories within Colombia or the indigenous territories within you know, the Amazon further erases that. So um, I would heartily say yes. And I think in terms of, you know, there are kind of social science methodological ways to engage with um, communities that are not reflected at the nation state level, but I would actually want to challenge us as scholars and students and us kind of think through the policy analysis to even as we're describing the geopolitics of the political economy to not not use the shorthand of you know the nation state does this as if the US was some as if we were all you know subsumed within a very bad decision that the previous administration made you know, in 2017, the US did this. Well, there was many people, the vast majority, who did not sign on to that agreement that the technical government and representative of the US um, obstructed, you know, some climate or broader environmental issue internationally. So I think it's a really nuanced question. And I, I'm so heartened that students are asking it. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Will IR ever be taught in our lifetime in a manner away from the sort of Westphalian system? <laughs> that would be good. Well, there's always lots of counter schools of IR, right? So, you know, we start with a nation state, but then we deconstruct the nation state and we do all kinds of critical theory and, right. and epistemic communities and civil, global civil society and yeah. So it's always funny to me, you know, the, what are they called? The retreat of the state was one book. And then another book was bringing the state back in and, you know, how important is the state and is this, is civil society merely epiphenomenal or, you know, all of these kinds of debates around um, among IR theorists um, are a little amusing, but, um, you know, you see these arguments going on all the time, that recent book by Graham Allison about, you know, basically will China and the US go to war inevitably because China is rising and the US is falling. And, you know, if you study the Thucydides trap inevitably, even when Sparta and Athens didn't want to go to war, they went to war anyway. You know, this is all IR, it's good old IR stuff. Yeah, so anyway, um, more comments? Here's another question. Tess, oh, hi Tess. When Simon asserts that carbon removal will be necessary, is that because we lack the technology or other means to transition quickly enough or because we lack the political will? If the latter, is it more likely that there will be political will to implement carbon removal responsibly? Yeah, look, um, carbon removal is going to be needed whatever pathway we take into the future. Carbon removal is used now as part of climate change response. 
right? So there are lots of different ways to remove, again, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, managing farmlands, planting trees, um, dealing with stuff in the in coastal regions and the oceans, right? Um, and so it's, you know, for, for me, these questions about technology are never, um, are we going to use the technology or not? It's always how can technology best be utilized in pursuit of particular social futures, right? What is the world we're trying to create together? Um, and then where does the technology fit into it? Um, and so just just to, I'm, I'm dancing around your question, Seth, because it's a, it's a good one, but it's a hard one, right? Um, but the, I, I think my, my basic answer is, um, basically retreating back into my chapter, um, if carbon removal is done well, that is, it's done according to social safeguards, it's done with strong governance guardrails around it, it's done um, as a small piece of a large set of responses to climate change that center um, the needs of people, particularly frontline communities, those who have suffered the most under climate change, then carbon removal can be a necessary and important part of climate change work. Um, but if carbon removal is handed to nation states and to powerful corporations and used as a way to sidestep other forms of climate action, then we get into trouble, right? Um, if carbon removal is just another way for the fossil fuel company to write the rules around which the world operates, we get into trouble. Um, and so, you know, I, one of the things that we're seeing in conversations around technological response options in climate change circles um, there's lots of retreat into camps. Some people saying, of course, we need big technologies. Um, a lot of, in particular, critical civil society voices saying, we can't buy into false solutions is the language that's, that's used around climate change. Um, and false solutions is used to encompass a whole range of things from biofuels to certain applications of solar panels to carbon removal to what's called solar geoengineering. Um, and I think we just got to be more careful than that, right? We can't just imagine a world in which human beings turn away from everything technological in pursuit of something else. Technology will be a part of the world that gets created. And we need to understand the roles for particular types of technologies configured in certain ways in the futures that get created. Um, was that just too ponderous and academic? I have no idea. Um, but hopefully that, that starts to get at the question, Seth. Are there any other questions? Um, if can, not, can I jump in and just yeah. comment on, on Tess, that there's such a nuance to Tess's question. Um, and I don't, I, Tess, I haven't had the honor of meeting you yet, but there's such a nuance to this question, which is that um, many of the geoengineering projects are proposals at this stage, solar radiation, all these are so big. They're so ambitious. They're so like sci-fi, next level technological coordination. And it seems ironic that if people and kind of governance or policymakers are willing to think big on the technological level, that they wouldn't be willing to think big on the let's reforest or agroecology or, you know, these other dimensions of um, carbon sequestration that are not high tech from on high, but actually grounded in land just redistribution and, you know, reforesting and agroecological agro restoration. And somehow those seem outlandish thinking about that direction, but the massive kind of sci-fi, um, you know, tech doesn't seem outlandish. That seems somehow like reasonable and prudent. So I feel like there's yeah. an interesting nuance to Tess's question. Yeah, yeah totally. That's a, that's a great point, Garrett. Yeah, sometimes people can, are can trained. I, can I respond quickly there, Judy? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think one of the things that happens with technology conversations around the environment is that technology is viewed as a way to sidestep politics, right? It's really hard to get lots of people to change the way that they live so that we can have a, a livable climate system, right? It's the thinking. Um, and so maybe we can just have big technological silver bullets that solve these problems and nothing about our lives needs to change, which is really um, perverse thinking. Um, because of course, te technologies get wrapped up in politics and technologies are, product of, are products of political contestation. Um, and so what we need is the, is the sort of interrogation which Tess is guiding us to, which is what's the appropriate role for certain types of technology centered in what? Community control, the appropriate forms of governance that can take us into the shared futures that we're looking to create. Now, rather than imagining there's some sort of technological workaround, 
Um, so I think I think the, the the kind of nuance in the question, Garrett, is in part what you're driving at. Um, it's it's to it's to help us kind of think through um, that we don't have easy answers anymore around any of the big environmental challenges that we face. There's no kind of one thing that's going to come along um, and be our savior. Um, the the, the future is going to be really really messy, whichever pathway we end up walking down. I think recognizing that also that, you know, the technological solution is not really a depoliticized solution to be able to actually say, hey, no, there's, <laughs> this is politicized as well. Because I think, Garrett, that's why people are kind of taken aback by, you know, your, you know, pathway. It's like all to whatever, um, you know, social, you know, no. <laughs> It also um, depends a lot on the training of people who are in power. Um, I know in China nowadays, many, many of the top leaders went through engineering schools. And so naturally they think, well, we're going to shoot so silver iodide on the Tibetan plateau and make it rain and replenish the glaciers that way. And then we're going to wrap the glaciers with blankets and slow their well, their melting. And then we're going to go mine helium three from the far side of the moon. And then we're going to like put solar panels in space and shoot things. It's like little boys with trucks, you know, <laughs> like if they know how to do it, then let's try to do it. And that circumvents the whole much messier process of justice and communities and connection to land and all of these things that we all care so much about. So, um, all right. I think that that's the end of this session. I want to say one last thing. When I announced this session as a book talk to our 50 incoming master's students, and I told them normally a book talk has wine and cheese and crackers and they were very excited. <laughs> so raise your virtual wine and cheese glass to celebrate the publication of this book. <laughs> and then line up and get our virtual signatures on the book. No, but really just go to the website, download the book. Um, I hope you'll find something in there that will be valuable for you. And um, if you want to hear every chapter um, author speak, there's a YouTube video that covers all 11 chapters and all 19 contributors. So um, we have that too. All right, everybody, have a happy afternoon. Thank you, Christiana, very much. Thank you, Clark Captioners, very much. Um, have a good day. Bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, audience, for participants. Great questions. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>